Hi, my name is David Rogers. Thanks for joining me. Landscapes are the stage for our photography and birds, animals, people, trees and flowers are the actors and the way we work together with light and with our equipment we are able to capture extraordinary pictures. I'm going to show you some pictures that I've taken in my journey as a photographer. I was started began, began in the 1990s as Reader's Digest, English writing and environmental science and I was a writer and I moved into photography quickly I'm enjoying that that as an outlet and I met uh, David Steele and David Bristow from Getaway Magazine and they were photojournalists starting that at the time as Africa was opening up and I started traveling around Africa and photographing and that was a time of transparencies and when uh, we had a target market of South African readers thirsty for knowledge and we photographed landscapes and took covers and double page spreads and it was a time where you couldn't actually influence the colors of your pictures. We used to work in slide film and there was no shadows and highlights and getting the right pictures at the right time was critical. And we all knew as photojournalists in those days that if you took good pictures, you'd go to the best places. So we, we worked hard at it. It was, a, it was a fun time and getting those pictures and that experience under the belt was a lot of my learning. And I went freelance in the 19, in, in 2000 and began uh, exploring through Zambia and doing microlight flights and helicopter flights and overland trips and gathering information for my first books. And um, it, was a, it was a great time. And then obviously photographing game lodges has always been a big part of my life and capturing the landscapes that, they, that, they, um, that they're there for. That's been big in it. Family travel through Africa. We experienced a lot of countries of family and that's a great way to learn more about places. And it was through photo workshops that I really got to see some of these other places with different eyes, the eyes of my clients and photographers. And I learned a great deal during that about teaching and about also understanding how other people think and see. Ultimately, there are always two people in the photographer and you're just one of them. How people respond to your pictures is critical and social media has become very important and replaced perhaps the readership of magazines that used to be the way we used to get our feedback. This is not all about the camera. This was taken with an iPhone. So my, my thought to you is, don't worry about what you got, just get the shot and work on it. But you've got to find the right landscape first. And I want to say these sometimes very much closer to home than we might think. This is where I had my family holidays as a kid in Arniston. And then moving up and down our coast, we have plenty of opportunities right here. And um, the flowers that are up every spring, the Maquiland draws us. Ponderland, beautiful landscapes and rivers and uh, places like Waterfall Bluff, which we visit. It's mountains and it's rivers and it's structure that makes great landscape destinations. And this is the uh, Sarbi Sand area and the rivers there captivate us and you photograph animals um, in them. So it's, it's what's really um, good destinations to choose, the places with great river frontage. But open spaces in Atosha are also outstanding for photography. And going up to Namibia, you see these incredible landscapes which photograph so beautifully and up to the Kaneni, you cannot believe how much we have on our doorstep in Africa. Botswana, of course, great for, great for landscapes and of course Luangwa, where I've been visiting many years, for many years and it's, it's a great place that I love and Lua Plains, which is also close by to there and um, the Okavango, mini Okavango and Madagascar the Seychelles, and of course Kenya, with its iconic landscapes. And Indutu, which is in Tanzania, for the migration, the landscape opportunities, and through Kenya, up north towards the, the northern parts of Kenya, and the Great Lakes, and in Gorongoro Crater. <clears throat> These are some of the places that we like to visit on our workshops. And to give you an idea of the stage for photography, but before going there, we've got to think about when and the light we're going to be photographing with. And often the rainy season in South Luangwa is when we go there and the river is in flood and dramatic clouds make for awesome photography and you can photograph right through the day. The dry season is very different. A focus on different landscapes and obviously concentrations of predators, different light conditions. In Namibia, the lighting there is extraordinary, but only for a brief time in the morning where you've got to capture those long shadows. And we work very hard to be in the right places at the right time. And how things are photographed in these places and the light we use and the time of day, staying in late into the parks to get the backlight also makes for great photography and underexposing these pictures. And the dust of Amboseli, maybe we don't find places comfortable always, but 
capturing these photographs is often in difficult and interesting conditions. So we're going to photograph from early in the morning when the shadows are long and the light is interesting. And we're going to go through to the evening. Different light, mixing light, mixing ambient and spotlight, different times of day and the blue light and the golden light, we can create different, different opportunities. And going from sunset into the night where we leave our cameras going and you keep shooting and keep shooting and keep shooting and get different effects. This is Lua. Lua Plains again, the reflections of water and the stars and that setting sun, just such a dramatic picture. And the stars with very long exposures to get the circles, 32 minutes on this picture, heading south. We're lining up our picture using, using the southern point of the sky and setting our, our, um, our, our time to sort of get the right shot. And here for the pinprick stars, we're going to have very, very fast, much faster, or 20 seconds is not that fast, but we're not going to see the movement yet. We're going to set our ISO quite high, but we're going to be shooting at fairly short times to capture these Milky Way shots, which incidentally are best taken in the earlier months of April, May, in the March, April, May in the Southern Hemisphere when you get the, uh, the band of the solar system lying nice and low in the sky. Phosphorescence, these opportunities come after dark. Phosphorescence in the sea with the stars. Okay, so those are the, the, weather, the weather factors and what we're going to be, once we're in the place, we're going to be working the shot. We're going to be moving around. A good photographer is knowing where to stand, a good photograph. That's, there's a lot of truth in that. We've got to move around, take our tripod, find different places, different angles, different foregrounds, different backgrounds. It's not a static thing where you're going to expect a landscape to be in front of you. Take your picture with your eye first, then your camera, and then get your tripod set up in that order. Moving back from the scene for the scale helps us get the wider perspective. And here again, photographing, we want to get to the foreground of interest. So we're going to find something structural in the foreground to give us that foreground, middle ground, background. And again, scale, drama, framing, these are all techniques that we can use by moving ourselves, moving our models into the right positions. Animals might move into position for us too, we can just hope so. Also in Namibia. And it's cropping, deciding what we're going to include in the picture, creating reflections, moving around, finding a place that's a good vantage point. So constantly making decisions, thinking, where are we going to be, where are we going to be? Dramatic skies, foreground, what are we going to find? That's something interesting. Work the shot. And here again, flowers in the foreground, triangulation with the rocks, background, depth to a picture, all constructed. That picture as opposed to that, very much flatter, but also interesting. It's got some, some structure by that, that windmill helps and the leading lines going through. And then again, foreground, 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 always for landscapes. And with the cosmos and the Drakensberg. And the foreground of these three trees with the lines going off diagonal triangulation into the background distance with the mountains and the leading lines of roads. These are tools that can help us as we move around, standing on the roof of the car after sunset, waiting, for, getting the shot, then waiting for the light. And then just taking one's chances on railway lines, leading lines with reflections and sometimes just being a bit lucky. Aerial photography, great way to get a different aspect on things. Here we are, foreground still important, concentrating, getting your, your shutter speed obviously high enough so that you're going to get it in focus, but not so high that it's going to um, freeze the chopper blades. So we've got to focus on that. And again, getting up and away in a drama, foreground shots for the landscapes, making it smaller than the drama of the scene that we're photographing. Finding scale with people, the drama of the clouds, the colors, the way they contrast against the gray. All the time, we're just thinking, planning, structuring photographs, and sometimes getting a bit lucky. The framing as well in this picture. So these are things that we do by physically moving ourselves around to create more interesting and better pictures. Some of the stuff can be done in camera. A camera does not create a real picture. There are various tools in it that change the way we see reality. Our eye is much better at seeing a much bigger dynamic range we can design through exposures, through the lenses we use, through the cropping. There are so many different ways that we can alter the reality of what people are going to experience with our pictures. 
Here's an example of a flattened, compressed landscape using a very long lens. After dark, after the sun's gone down, you're focusing in on a small area with a 400mm lens, just picking out that tiny bit of drama that you want to bring across, and those layers of mountains in the blue. And then waiting for the elephants coming out, out the bushes and Amboseli to drink the water. And the timing of these things is critical, but then the lens is the compression, getting in close, the drama. Here, something to break the yellow, the flowers, finding a little patch, something to break it, and the soft focus going out and in the foreground, and that is critical, and that we achieve with a wide aperture and a long lens. Okay, so here we are looking at more high-key pictures. We're exposing for the dark areas, overexposing in the camera to give ourselves the detail that we want. The same with this tree and this gully going down here. We're exposing for the dark areas. We're blowing out the bits that we don't want. And again, here in the, in the Massa Mara. And then also with exposure, underexposing minus two or whatever at sunset to bring out the reds. Otherwise, we're finding our camera is going to overexpose things because it's going to concentrate on the blacks. More technically interesting, modern, the painterly effects of multiple exposures created in camera with two exposures, with nine exposures. Again, it's not just happening by chance. We're focusing on structure of the colors and looking for things and then taking nine pictures with incremental tiny movements to create the picture that we want and it's pleasing. Fewer exposures. And here, a swirling camera motion. One, two, three, nine pictures and then put together on one photograph in camera and we get an interesting effect swirling on a point. And again, it doesn't happen just with one shot. We're making many, many, many shots of this before we get it absolutely right. Okay, next, using filters. Slowing down the exposure. That has to be done externally if it's too bright in the bright conditions. So with darker lens over the front, we're allowed to shoot anything from two or three seconds up to 15 seconds will create these sorts of effects. And, um, and the drama of these, taking out the detail of the little waves that might create a more, a more busy, disturbing image, you can have a softness that comes through and, um, in that. So there are various filters, ND filters, big stoppers that we can use. I don't use graduated filters all of the time. I prefer to do it in Lightroom, but I do do them some of the time. And that will be darkening, for darkening the skies. A blur, also with a camera blur, using a slower shutter speed, maybe of half a second, we're creating interesting painterly effects. And again, with a zoom blur, where we're in pulling back from a focal point with a longer shutter speed. All interesting. So, after we've got our picture and grabbed it, we can get creative in post-production. And how we do it in Lightroom to get from the left picture to the right is very, very carefully structured plan, understanding the picture, understanding what you want to get, bringing out colors, brightening colors, darkening colors, brushing in the same way that the masters would brush pictures out in the old days in the darkroom. We now are doing that in Lightroom. And it's our skill and it's our finesse and our time and our vision when we took the picture that helps us to create those beautiful pictures and the backgrounds. Now, these sometimes there are creating black and white pictures. You can do it with various filters in Lightroom. There are various options and you can create those afterwards. So you shoot your original color and then process in black and white. And black and whites tend to work very well as um, images on walls. They are more easy on the eye perhaps and, and, and fit in well with any color schemes in a house. Okay, balancing at this time of day we're pulling and pushing the light, but we also sometimes using three different images, underexposed, overexposed, merge them, bring them together in Lightroom and create um, a harmonious picture with a higher dynamic range. We do the same with, with um, interior photographs when you're pulling and pushing and trying to bring out the detail in the dark, suppressing the detail in the highlights, or can be done in post-production. And here, when we're constructing landscapes with panoramas, again, we can easily see, put them together in Lightroom afterwards or in Photoshop. Very, very easily done. So that's it for me. We do do one-on-one -on -one tuition, if it's interesting for you. We do do photo travel. And these are the ways to get hold of us on social media or through email. Thank you so much for joining.